Hello. Welcome to this story. It is my story. It is about Chernobyl radiation and pregnancies. The Chernobyl disaster is not over. It is still ongoing. And therefore, long-term studies are essential. So why this reminder? It is because the most forgotten victims of this disaster are children, in particular the embryo and the fetus. And because many children are dying that could live. Much is known how to reduce such tragedies. And moreover, because to forget is to condone and because speaking out is sooner or later conducive to solutions. We need cooperation and not confrontations. This is a story of an idea that became the OmniNet Ukraine organization for which I speak, an organization dedicated to the prevention and care of birth defects. It arose immediately after the Chernobyl explosion in 1986, but it was obvious that not much could be done as long as the Soviet Union controlled the area, limited access and distorted the data. However, it was also evident by 1990 or so that the Soviet Union was collapsing and it was quite likely that Ukraine was to become independent. In preparation of such eventuality, I obtained an NIH grant from the National Institute of Health to hold a round table on occasion of the International Human Genetics Congress, and we scheduled the event exactly on August the 24th, which was the day and celebrated since as the day of independence of Ukraine. We were able to ensure the presence of a senior representative of Ukraine, an expert in teratology, and Dr. Lazuk from Belarus, who at the time already was conducting a monitoring system of congenital malformations. Among others, Participants included Dr. James Neal, who is well known for having been the director of the Hiroshima Nagasaki investigations and contributed this point of view. Dr. Warkany, who is considered a founder of medical teratology, a term I will clarify shortly. So uh, he contributed this etching, which is called Shadows Without Men, this is Hiroshima. And shortly thereafter, I was invited to present my idea of what could be done to the US Congress, which eventually led to some funding. It also led to a partnership with the March of Dimes, then known as the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation. Plans were refined. And in 1998, the president of the March of Dimes, the vice president for science for the March of Dimes, myself, a representative of the CDC from the monitoring system in California, attended a meeting in Kiev and an agreement was reached to create OmniNet centers across some of the selected provinces of the country. Some terms that may slip in during this presentation may need some clarification. OmniNet Ukraine is an international not-for-profit organization registered in Kiev, and its purpose is to care and prevent birth defects. The term teratogen refers to any agent that can alter the development of an embryo, fetus, or child. Mutagen is any agent that can change the instructions of the genome. Oncogen is any 
agent that can cause cancer, or in other words, carcinogen. Gametes are specialized cells. They are cells of fertilization, of fertility. And somatic is a professional term for cells that have to do with the body, but not for, with its reproduction. In this box, we underscore the importance of what is population surveillance, which is what OmniNet does. It means you survey a complete population, not helter-skelter. So members of whatever we define as population have to be examined and determined whether th there are anomalies, how many, what kind, compared to the frequency of some total aspect, in our case, births. So normally the frequency of anomalies is given per 10,000 births. So what is a population? A complete population can be from a county, from a region of a province that is north and south or east and west. A province is a defined subpopulation of a country and so forth. And going in more detail, an area of the province, a county of a province, a village of a province, a family, and so forth. The point is it has to be complete. We are going to be talking about Ukraine. We are going to be talking about a region called Volin, which is in the northwest. We are going to be talking about one of the provinces of this region, and that is Rivne. And within Rivne, there are two areas. North is Polisia and south is not policia. And what are we monitoring? Well, teratogens can cause death, can cause anomalies. Anomalies can be multiple. Patterns of concurrent anomalies, they can be recognized occasionally as being characteristic, like Down syndrome. So they are called Down syndrome or syndromes. Mental deficit or mental retardation. This is the most sensitive developmental area of the human body, and therefore this is one of the most frequent developmental anomalies, functional in nature. Microcephaly implies reduced size of the brain and therefore reduced size of the head. Microphthalmia means that the eyes are smaller, and in our case we include instances where the eye cannot be seen, so it may be called at times anophthalmia. I hope these terms are not used, but if they slip in, you can always come back. Neural tube defects is a basket of anomalies, which include the lack of brain or anencephaly, an open spine of spina bifida, and other subvarieties. So, how did we do it? OmniNet established resource centers across Ukraine. Some are closed because of Mr. Putin. But we concentrated in particular in these three provinces in the west and northwest of Ukraine. Here is shown a sketch of the northern regions of Ukraine. Here is the position of the Chernobyl nuclear complex and its explosion. Here is the radioactive cloud moving toward Sweden and later on toward northern UK. Here is the province Rivne. Here is the northern half called Polisia. And as I will show next, these are wetlands. So here is Polisia, to give you an idea. Rivers on the surface, water on the surface, rivers under the surface. And these soils cannot hang on, cannot bind nucleides. So therefore, nucleides that fall in here quickly or more quickly than anywhere else in Ukraine enter the food chain. So here you have children born in the province of Rivne. We examine all births in Rivne. And then the category of anomaly here is eye anomalies, 
which are derivatives of the brain, and then we establish how common are these, and this is a fairly rare developmental anomaly. Teratogens are any agent that can disrupt the development of a child before or after birth. Radiation is a prime teratogen, and it has a propensity or a penchant to impact the brain, and from the brain is derived each eye. Here is another panel of children with uh, malformations that fall into the general category of neurotube defects, NTD. Notice the enormous number of these children in a single province, 474. And then the subcategories like lacking brain, 196, spina bifida, 278, and other related anomalies of this category. Notice that in spina bifida, there were nearly 280 instances. However, born alive were only 117. And of these, 50 died very, very early in childhood. This underscores the lethal nature of the impacts of whatever teratogen may cause this, and the suspect number one is radiation, but certainly there are other teratogens that may act in a similar fashion. So here is a sketch of the Rivne province and its counties. And because we conduct a population-based surveillance across this province, we know how many cases of whatever malformations occur. And we know that in the instance of neurotube defects, there were 474 instances during this period, 2,216. If we project these 474 to the whole country, then we could report to the capital that this is about 11,000 children that will need care and a substantial one of that. We also notice that the majority are not born alive, but nonetheless, countrywide, this would be about 2,800 instances that will be living, but 43% are not going to live very long. 1,200 or so will perish soon during infancy or early childhood. Now, because Public health has a primary central role in prevention. Then it is important to point out that science has shown that 50% of neurotube defects can be prevented by folic acid. That would represent in Ukraine 5,000 instances, or among those who are born alive, 600 children. Just imagine 600 children parading, laughing, jumping, that instead of being buried, could enjoy springtime. So here is the sketch of the Policia province, but this time we'll pay attention to ecological factors. The pink means polluted by Chernobyl radiation and the yellow means officially designated as not polluted. And if instead of reporting a general prevalence rate, we do a particular prevalence rate in the polluted area, we see that it's over 21. And in the not polluted is about 15. That's a very significant contrast. We also know that in Europe, the prevalence is about 10.5, so that the prevalence in both areas is higher than in Europe. So there is room to maneuver to reduce these rates, at least to those across Europe, but Europe is high comparing to the US, so Europe should reduce its own rate by about 50% to about five per 10,000. But in addition, we are interested to measure more about the radiation factor. And we find that nearly 10% of pregnant women in the pink area 
have very high body counts, that is, they incorporated in their body 5,000 or more becquerels of radioactive radionuclide cesium-137. This is not so in the yellow zone, which is then 0.2%. That's expected because officially this is designated as polluted and this is not. So therefore it confirms that the division of the province in two parts, at least as far as radiation impacts, is sound. And then, being again a compulsive and ambitious investigator, we add the location of two nuclear power complexes, multiple nuclear generators, and we find that the rate here of prevalence is higher than the average for the zone, much higher, but it's also just as high next to this nuclear power complex one in the pink area and one in the yellow area. We also note that instead of having cesium in their body, like here, they don't. And instead of having cesium in their body, they don't. And then we look into families that were resettled in this county, and we find again that the rates of neurotube defects are elevated, but the incorporated cesium is low. So these people eat cesium, these don't, these people don't need cesium, these people don't need cesium, these people don't need cesium. That is a question that needs to be addressed. So our findings then are reported in the most prestigious journals we could find. And we are very grateful to the American Human Biology Society that highlighted our studies in Policia and we'll show you where Policia is. And what are the implications of our finding? And that was already published nearly 10 years ago. We also published our finding in medical journals that uphold strict publication standards such as the official journal of the Academy of Pediatrics, the Journal of Medical Genetics of Europe, the Journal of Teratology Medical Genetics in Japan, and therefore we think that these reports, time and again, years separate from each, show that the alterations we observe are persistent and significant. But then, here is a problem. Why are these studies virtually ignored by leading agencies? Not a word. It is a form of censorship. We know, and nobody disputes, that these are one of the most polluted regions of Ukraine. And we know that these rates of neural tube defects are the highest in Europe, and they are collected. This data is collected according to international standards. There is no wiggle room here to start saying that these are credible or not, whatever. We have done this for over 15 years. And the same happens when you analyze, you see the same over and over and over again. So it is persistent. So why the silence? Well, perhaps it is because the international agencies, mainly the World Health Organization, that disseminates a negative posture crafted by the IAEA, the International Atomic Power Energy Agency, I'm sorry, uh, is uh, sort of difficult for them to admit that they are wrong. Here is an example of the negative posture and reiterative language. For instance, concerning Chernobyl, it is stated that the radiation doses are too low, they were not measured. Not certainly in children, who are much more sensitive. No effects, this, no studies of this kind. The studies need to be population-based, nor are there expected any, well, that's an extraordinary non-scientific position in view that the IAEA, WHO, or other agencies did not sponsor any substantive investigations of this kind. And if there are reports of an increasing 
observation of congenital anomalies, then they are attributed to improved reporting conditions, etc. So here is another example, but this time applied to Fukushima, the same language. Notice the links, which in a video cannot be active, but you can visit the full language of these releases by the agencies in the addendum. We spoke about a negative attitude not only limited to negating the possibility of developmental anomalies due to radiation, it extended as well to the now well-documented tragic epidemic of thyroid carcinoma. These agency in agencies introduced a variety of doubts that this was not an effect of radiation. And these claims that much of the symptomatology was radiophobia, the popular press, as well as the public, pointed out about concerns of cancer and suicides among adolescents. It took years, but it was done. A study of adolescents exposed to Chernobyl radiation conclusively shows that the worst impacted area is Rivne again. The rate of cancer in Rivne is shown here as being the highest among five provinces screened at 1.85 per 10,000. This is an astoundingly high rate. And in terms of depression, again, in Rivne, the rate is higher than in the other four provinces screened, nearly 19%. This is how the children viewed the world shortly after the Chernobyl disaster. These drawings are from a school not far from Chernobyl. They see the world as barren and cruel, as divided in those impacted or not. And one child very ably called this world of Chernobyl a poisoned rose. I would not call such children radiophobic. Most adults in Ukraine are fully aware of what the poisoned Chernobyl rose is. They are also aware that they have been branded as being radiophobic. Such a label is widely rejected and considered offensive. They are aware, most of them are at least, that external radiation is not the main factor. The risk is the ingestion and breathing of radioactive pollutants. And it is fair to say that they are at least, if not more, concerned about the future children or those that are growing up than themselves. They reject declarations by agencies that assure the population that radiation from Chernobyl cannot possibly be a cause of developmental anomalies. The reaction is that's not good enough. Many, you can hear, say, prove it. Policia provides a unique scenario to study multi-generational effects of radiation. This is because the radiation is ongoing and the population of Policia is stable. So just briefly, ionizing radiation, we know it can impact body cells and mutate them. It can impact ovarian and testicular cells and mutate reproductive cells. We know that radiation has direct effects and kills, like in the case of the liquidators of Chernobyl. But in Policia, the exposure is chronic, is through ingestion and consumption of contaminated water as well as breathing uh, smoke and gas that are polluted by radiation. These women already developed cannot 
manifest malformations. Therefore, they do not manifest the teratogenic effects, but they manifest the rest of it. In the case of mutations, then two kinds of mutations can be generated. Somatic cells, and they cause the radiation exposure syndromes, and the mutations of the ovaries. So these women, year after year, may transmit that to their offspring as long as they are reproducing. Let's look at the scenario of a daughter of a woman that lived near the times of the Chernobyl accident. Her daughter, that is in utero, is exposed to the same radiation she is that floats in her body from consuming contaminated food. Her daughter then is exposed to teratogenic effects because she's an embryo and she may develop neural tube defects. But she also may inherit a mutation from the ovary of her mother and develop any number of hereditary disorders known to man. So this repertoire is very similar to that of the mother, but it includes teratogenic effects. Now let's look at the granddaughter of the woman that uh, lived in Policia at the time of the accident and had a daughter, and this daughter then had a daughter herself. There are two scenarios. One is that the daughter conceived away from Policia, or that the daughter conceived and remained in Policia. If she did so, then her risks are the same as her own. So you can go back to the previous screen. But if she moved away, let's say to Germany or Italy, all what she can do is to pass the mutation to her daughter, and then all the cells of her daughter, somatic and gonadal, will contain the mutation. And the consequences are going to be any of the hereditary disorders known to man. This is how gonadal mutations are forever. There will be citizens in Germany and Italy that may or may not remember that their grandmother was exposed to Chernobyl. Here is another perspective concerning pregnancy and their outcome in Policia. Women in Policia generally conceive between the ages of 18 and up to 40 years of age. At the time of the accident, 18-year-olds and older became pregnant between 1986 up to 2008 when they were reaching 40 and no longer were fertile. Another group are the daughters of these women and they reach the age of 18 by 204 and deliver babies up to 2026. And a third group is the daughters of the daughters which will be delivering babies beginning 2022 and 2044. We have observed in the daughters of the original group and the sons higher rates of neural tube defects. And we also observe neural tube defects in the children of the daughters of the original group. To what extent the neural tube defect patterns in the second and third generation of women differs, we do not know, but genomic studies should address this question efficiently. This is an example of the complexity of the questions that emerge when you have a favorable scenario to conduct investigations of this sort. So among the frequent ask questions to me and my associates is if elevated incorporated levels of cesium increase NTD prevalence what do we think? We think probably yes. Evidence points strongly in that direction. Are there other contributory factors to the rise of neural tube defects and other congenital anomalies? Of course there are. Among them, 
we only speak of cesium, but there are many other nuclides like strontium, plutonium, and so forth. And low folates in the diets have a strong negative effect. Negative effect in terms that DNA repair damaged by radiation may be less efficient. So again, yes, other factors are likely, and therefore research is more complex. Can radiation damage descendants that is beyond just the adults? Absolutely, future generations may be impacted in a variety of ways. Genetic mutations, their epigenetic effects. Therefore, our answer is possibly that needs to be studied. Are further studies, including of genomic impacts, warranted? Our answer is absolutely yes, but that is for others to judge. And can impacts of radiation or NTD be reduced? And the answer is absolutely yes, and it should be done regardless of any other investigations. My overall conclusions concern radiation impacts on pregnancies and the need for community intervention <coughs> prevention programs. I believe that the impact of radiation on pregnancy should be routinely investigated after every nuclear accident because each accident and each impacted population are unique and extrapolations such as those concerning Hiroshima and Nagasaki to Ukraine are entirely inappropriate. Secondly, I believe that community intervention prevention programs cannot be delayed due to scientific considerations only. They should be promptly implemented if we know how to reduce the burden of the impacts on society and individuals of developmental anomalies. We know how to reduce exposures to radiation, to alcohol, and therefore such programs should be implemented without delay. And in a few words about myself, I can tell you that my opinions that are expressed here are personal and not necessarily represent those of my associates. When you stop the motion, you can read some aspects of my background. So what now? What option does OmniNet face? Basically three. We could continue our investigations, but our resources are at the limits many of those investigations that should be done we will not be able to do without new infusion of resources and partners. To acquire partners, which is an advocacy in progress, is critical. We need specialists in different fields of teratology and genetics. Investigations must be including aspects of genomics. And the case surveillance and investigations may cease. We may not be able to continue and instead create a data repository on the basis of about 300 births. That is the least, but that may be the only option if circumstances do not change. So what can I or what can you do or what can we do optimally is to distribute this video widely. You should share, if possible, this video with those most likely to contribute to our efforts. I also suggest that you view the addendum because it contains additional suggestions as well as data and interpretations which may produce further notions <coughs> of contributions. And please share your views, write to us. The addendum includes notes, data, sources, references, but most important, active links. You can go there and open the access. Please write to me and thank you for watching. 
and please again accept my best wishes.